It would do wonders for my nerves. After all, I have a business to run, you know? Is there a draft in here? Angler and Wolfie square off a debate recap tonight at 11. Murder, she wrote, will not be seen at this time due to the following special TV2 presentation. Murder, she wrote, will return next week at its regularly scheduled time. John Engler and Howard Wolpe. Who will get your vote in 94? TV2 presents the Candidates' Debate, sponsored by the Economic Club of Detroit. And now your moderator, Eyewitness News anchor, Rich Fisher. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first televised Michigan gubernatorial debate in the metropolitan Detroit area. My name is Rich Fisher of TV2 Eyewitness News in Detroit, and I'm going to be your moderator for this evening's debate. Joining me tonight is a very distinguished panel of reporters from Metropolitan Detroit. I'd like to begin with uh, my colleague and co-anchor here at TV2, Kuehl Perkins. WWJ reporter Roberta Jacina is our second panelist. And finally, Detroit Free Press columnist Hugh McDermott. Now, the candidates tossed a coin earlier to determine the order of opening and closing remarks. Governor John Engler won the toss, so we will begin our opening remarks with Governor Engler. Governor? Good evening. Thank you, Rich, and good evening to those who are watching and are listening tonight. In this election year, the choice is very clear. Do we keep Michigan moving forward, or do we turn back? Four years ago, we turned Lansing upside down. We stood up for families and taxpayers. We said no to special interests, to bureaucrats, and to the welfare lobby. I want to keep Michigan moving forward. In Michigan, we've been keeping our promises. We've been fulfilling the commitments we made. I think this election is one where my vision, cutting taxes, creating good paying jobs, reforming welfare, everyone can do something, safer streets and schools so kids can learn without violence and guns. This is the choice. My opponent has a different approach. From Washington, that's not the way Congress operates, that's not the way Washington operates. Can we trust a congressman to keep Michigan on the right track when he helped Washington be on the wrong track? I don't think so, and tonight, We'll talk about my agenda to move Michigan ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Engler. And now we will hear from the Democratic opponent of John Engler, Congressman Wolpe. Thank you. As you will hear tonight, my vision for Michigan is vastly different from John Engler's. In John Engler's Michigan, public education tax dollars are diverted to private academies and to payoffs for special interests. When I'm governor, that will stop. Public funds will go to public schools. And I'll reopen the Michigan Education Trust so you can save to send your kids to college. In John Engler's Michigan, auto insurance companies are the most profitable in the country. I'm going to push through real reform with a real 20% rate cut. In John Engler's Michigan, we had the largest prison break in 70 years. He blames everyone but his own policies. When I'm governor, the buck passing will stop. We'll make our prison secure. Make sure 20 years means 20 years. And create a powerful drug court. In John Engler's Michigan, he looks out for the rich and the powerful. As your governor, I'm going to be fighting for the middle class, for families that work hard every day. I'm going to be fighting for you. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, tell you what the ground rules are. Each candidate will have a minute and a half to answer a question. There will be a 45-second rebuttal. Now, let's begin this evening's debate. Let's go to my colleague, Hugh Perkins. Hugh? <clears throat> Mr. Wolpe. Recent polls by the Detroit News and the Free Press show that you are trailing John Engler by a wide margin, especially regarding the issue of trust. In your campaign ads and in your speeches, you have implied that Mr. Engler is deceitful. And yet polls show that many voters mistrust you more than they mistrust Mr. Engler. How do you explain that and how can you change that perception by election day? Well, let me say, first of all, that the, uh, the good news is that four years ago, John Engler was about at the same point that we are today. It's the last four weeks of a campaign that are the critical weeks. And as people begin to really center in on the real differences between John Engler and me, I'm confident that we're going to see the movement in the polls and that we're going to come out on top on election day. The issues are very clear. Uh, on the one hand, you have a governor who has used the power of his office all these years to protect uh, some of the most powerful interests in the state. The auto insurance companies, the utilities, the largest corporations. I'm going to be a governor that's out there fighting for the working families of Michigan. Uh, these are the people that have been left out. Uh, these are the people that have been working hard, that are concerned about what's happening to this state, concerned about our future, concerned about the kind of future their children are going to have. 
concerned about the, the kind of sa uh, lack of safety and security within their own neighborhoods, within their own communities. The problem is that too many people consider what you're saying, though, a slogan and not so much something well, that they can believe. Let me just lay out how the differences play themselves out in terms of policy. Education policy, for example. I believe that there is no higher priority for this state than education. I've laid out a 12-point agenda to fundamentally transform education in Michigan. I'm a teacher. If we cannot have kids coming out of school with marketable skills, we're going to stay with $5 an hour jobs, rather than the kind of high skill, high wage economy we need for Michigan. I've laid out that agenda to keep public dollars in public education. By contrast, John Engler's agenda is one that would take public tax dollars and shift them over to private academies, give them away to the tobacco merchants. That's wrong. We need public tax dollars to strengthen public education. Another example, auto insurance uh, policy. John Engler, throughout his Congressman, career... Congressman, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you. Your time is up. Uh, Governor Engler, rebuttal? Uh, I think my agenda four years ago was important to bring back. Cut taxes. We've done that 11 times. Reform welfare. We're leading the nation. Fight crime. Create jobs. 5.5% unemployment rate, the best in 20 years. I think because I kept my promises, people trust me in this election. I think they're also rejecting the very negative campaign of my opponent. And I, tonight's an opportunity for him, instead of talking about the negative things about John Engler, to tell us, tell the people of Michigan, how a congressman from Washington would hope to do in Michigan what he failed to, in Washington to be able to do. How could he keep Michigan on the right track when his record in Washington is quite the opposite? Bueller, your question for the governor. <clears throat> Mr. Engler, in an advisory vote a few weeks ago, Detroiters in overwhelming numbers expressed their desire to see casino gambling in Greektown, riverboat gambling on the shore. You are an elected official, but instead of listening to the will of the people, you seem to be, if not ignoring that mandate, at least delaying it. Why? Well, you know, one of the things that uh, the vote did not do, the advisory vote in Detroit, or the one earlier in Highland Park, or the one that's upcoming this November in Flint, is to amend state law, which prohibits casinos. State policy in Michigan flat out says that casinos are not prohibited. There's a backdoor way that was created by the Congress, by people like my opponent when they were there, to override state law and say, well, if you're working with an Indian tribe, and in fact, we do have eight casinos run by Indian tribes. Recently, Congress has now recognized three more tribes and said, uh, I expect that we'll have 11 casinos. But I've said that for this decision to be made by a governor, that I think there have to be all the facts on the table. We've got the racetracks who are saying they can only survive if they have casino gaming. The bar owners are saying the only way they can survive is through video poker. And I think as governor, I have to represent all 9.4 million people in this state. I respect the advisory vote. I think it's important information to have, but it by itself does not amend state law. And as governor, I think we have to be very, very careful just to simply stroke the pen and say we're going to override state law because we personally feel that's the way it ought to be. And so the Gaming Commission is a serious effort to lay down state policy to decide if we have 11 casinos run by Indians, should there be a 12th one that non-Indians could run? But is that commission an effort to block casino games? No, it is not. It's a serious effort to take a look at all of the issues that I've just uh, ticked off. And, and I think we've got to have a policy. If we're going to have a 12th casino, do we say no to the 13th? Or do we say no to the 14th? Or where do we draw the lines? And I think that uh, the one place we start is with the legislature, which said that all casinos are not uh, legal in Michigan, and really go back and look at the whole question. I personally have not supported the expansion of casino gaming to racetracks, nor to the bars. Governor, your time is up. A rebuttal from uh, Mr. Wolpe. This is not the only time that John Engler ignores the wishes of the people. Uh, I've said from the beginning, incidentally, that I think the local community should determine this issue, and that if people vote for casino gambling, that I, as governor, would act to implement and to cooperate with that decision. If the community chose not to implement casino gambling, then I think it would be wrong to impose that decision on the community. But John Engler has repeatedly ignored the wishes of the people. Two years ago, we voted against Proposal D, almost two to one. This was the so-called insurance reform, again, written by the insurance industry with John Engler's uh, assistance and guidance. People voted it down because they saw through it. They recognized it was a ripoff on the consumers and the on drivers of the state. And then he went in and to reorganize the Department of Natural Resources. What is his notion of reorganization? Close the public out of decisions. Allow the polluters to come ahead of the people. That's John Engler's policy. I will reopen the DNR. I will push thank through you, real insurance reform. Congressman Wolfe, thank you very much. Uh, your time is up. Let's move now to uh, our second panelist, uh, Roberta Jacina from WWJ Radio in Detroit. Roberta. Good evening, Congressman. 
You have repeatedly criticized the governor, saying that there's going to be this horrible multi-million dollar shortfall in education funding because of the recent property tax change. If you are not mistaken, or if you're not lying, as some people have claimed, where will you, and if you are elected, where are you going to get the money to uh, fill up this horrible shortfall? Let me say that I wish that it was a question that the governor had thought about before he implemented the school financing package. Because the reality is, and that's, those are not my claims, independent analysts are saying there will be a billion dollar shortfall a year after next in the school, in the school education fund. That is terrible for our future. What the governor has really done is to mortgage our future and that of our children. Uh, we are going to have to live with the system that has been created because it was a constitution that was changed. And so what I'm arguing is that I have laid out a whole agenda for change in education that begins with the imposition of a cap on administrative expenses. So we can make certain that every available dollar is, is going not to bureaucracy, but is going directly into the classroom. A 1% reduction, for example, in administrative costs would save $125 million a year. But we've got to go beyond that. And a lot of what has to be done is not simply a question of funds, it's a question of doing things more, smarter. We need a new core curriculum so that the students are learning the new kinds of skills and technologies that are relevant to the the new economy that is out there. We need tough standards. Let me tell you, in a Wolfie Stabenow administration, that diploma is going to mean something so that an employer knows that when a graduate comes out of school, that graduate has certain skills and certain competences. How are you going to guarantee that? We're going to guarantee that by, by establishing standards that we can against which to measure students and the performance of our schools so people will know exactly what, what kinds of competencies people have. We're not going to keep graduating people that have not met those skills, that do not have those competencies. Congressman, thank you very much. Uh, Governor, your rebuttal. Well, thank you very much. I certainly hope everyone was listening to the last answer because there was no response to the question posed. But that's perhaps because there doesn't need to be one. You see, there isn't a deficit. We've constitutionally guaranteed funding for education, and I'm very comfortable that the dollars are there. In fact, in 1991, when the dollars weren't there, we faced a $1.8 billion deficit. We balanced the budget without raising taxes and without cutting the education budget. The congressman uses this as a political charge to try to incite some support for himself, but he has no answer to the question you pose. There is no deficit, and this is merely a rearguard action to continue to replay Proposal A which passed with 70% of the people's support in this state. And it's a good thing that it did because 25 other states in America are now under court order, are involved in litigation to take control of school finance in those states. Instead, we're moving on to an agenda of reform and increased accountability. Governor, thank you very much. Roberta, your question for Governor Engler. Governor Engler, good evening. The AFL-CIO says there have been 12 jailbreaks from Michigan prisons involving 36 prisoners in four years and that you've cut state troopers in Michigan and 911 that you are not tough on crime that there have been 420 homicides in Detroit this year 1100 carjackings much the same rate as last year how have you worked to make say for instance the city of Detroit safer crime is the number one issue and what are you proposing to make every community in Michigan safer if you are reelected well I think it's a good question I think it's a very important question one I care deeply about because any murder, any crime is too much. Any jailbreak is too much. And I've said with respect specifically to jailbreaks at the state system, I accept full responsibility. And I also am proud of our accomplishments in reforming a system that we inherited that was, frankly, with some problems. And we've been so successful to date that I've had over 20,000 officers, men and women on the front streets, you know, front lines out there tonight protecting communities all across Michigan. The Detroit police officers, for example, the Police Officers Association of Michigan, Fraternal Order Police Deputies, over 50 prosecutors and sheriffs who stand with me. Why? Because in the last three and a half years, we've been able to produce about 110 different crime-related criminal justice agenda items. We win back the streets and the neighborhoods by fighting one street at a time, one community at a time all across our state. And we're doing that. We've added some 10,000 additional cells to our system. We're taking the most dangerous and violent people off our streets. We've reformed the parole system today, and we're not letting bad people out. We've passed in our state truth in sentencing legislation. We've given prosecutors and police many more tools with which to fight crime. So it's all part of that. Criminal justice spending, when we take state police, corrections department is up some 60% second only to education in terms of major increases. We've fixed the underfunding of the corrections department 
and we're proud of the progress that we've made. There's more to be done. And in the second term, one of the commitments I've said is we're going to end parole for murders. We're going to stop. Governor, I must interrupt you. I'm Thank sorry. You. Your time is up. Uh, Congressman Wolpe. I, I can't believe what the governor just said. He said that we have truth in sentencing in Michigan. He knows that bill is not effective yet. It is not law. It has not been implemented. That's simply not true. Any more than it is true that we have adequate staffing in our prisons. Make, be, be very clear. Ryan, with the tip of the iceberg, that particular prison escape, we had one prisoner over in the Saginaw facility that was accidentally released by his corrections department that went out, uh, who was uh, in, on an, under indictment for murder, who went out and within 24 hours killed someone else. We have a terrible problem of the staffing, of the training, of the Department of Corrections. And the governor has done absolutely nothing to deal with that serious management problem. He really does give new meaning to election year conversion. It's only this year that he suddenly discovered the issue of crime and violence. In his first state of the state message, in the second state of the state message, not one word of crime or violence. But now this year, suddenly, he's out there being tough on crime. Congressman, your time is up. Thank you very much. Let's go to our third uh, panelist this evening, Detroit Free Press uh, political uh, columnist, Hugh McDermott. Hugh? Mr. Wolpe, how absolute is your no new taxes and no new fees pledge that you made a couple of weeks ago on television, uh, especially in light of the fact that if you're elected governor, most of the experts say there will be room, given the Headley Amendment, still to raise taxes if you and the legislature wanted to. And also, is that not a contradiction with statements that you made earlier that describe no new taxes type pledges as irresponsible? Yeah. Let me say, I, I won't be stabbing the administration will not raise new taxes or fees. Right now, we are in fact at the heavy limit because John Engler's tax increases, the pieces of his package he does not like to talk about very much, have really uh, uh, have raised state revenues to the maximum permitted under the Constitution. If there is a further uh, gain in, in the income of the state, so that is not in fact the case, I would still argue that I would not support, I will not support as governor, new taxes or fees that are not approved by a vote of the people. There is so much cynicism around this days, these days about people's distrust of government. I want to be very clear that I want people to have some restoration of faith in government. I don't think you do that if you try to impose taxes in the way in which people have had them imposed did, did, upon did you earlier refer to such pledges as irresponsible? I said uh, the wash my lips pledges are, are I think, are irresponsible. Is this not basically the same thing? No, I, no I'm, I'm making this, I'm saying that the policy of our administration will be as I have described it. I mean, if the, if the earth falls out and, and uh, Michigan enters a tremendous disaster uh, and, and we have to take a second look at tax policy, so be it. But I, my policy is going to be as I have described it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Congressman. Uh, you? you have time to, uh, Governor has time for... Thank rebuttal. you. Yeah, I, I'd like to jump in on this because it is, I do remember St. Paul was converted on the way to Damascus, so it is just possible that... Uh, Congressman Wolpe has been converted during this campaign, and that could be a positive thing for him. But I think that where there's a tremendous contradiction is with the spending pledges that he's making all over the state. He's lining up interest groups right and left saying, I'll spend on this. We've already heard that tonight. I'll spend on this. Now, how does he pay for it? I don't believe his no new taxes pledge. Under an England administration, not only are we not going to be looking at raising taxes, we're going to continue to be cutting taxes as we've done 11 times in the first term. Hugh, your question now for the governor. Governor, um, you've made a great deal of schools of choice in the campaign uh, in the last uh, six months or so. Uh, a lot of your opponents and a lot of people in the education community are suggesting that you have a hidden agenda here and that you down deep would like to tamper with the Constitution and try to divert public tax money to private schools, particularly Christian schools. Um, if next year there were a serious effort to change the Constitution, would you oppose that? I'd have to see that whether or not there would be such an effort. I would not be part of an effort, and I'd want to see if somebody, through initiative, which is a right of the people in this state, to amend the Constitution, put on what it would look like. But let me tell you what the agenda is. It's a children's agenda. It's a children's agenda to give kids choices, to give parents and teachers choices. And across the nation, Democrat and Republican governors have been leading the way to develop charter schools. In fact, President Clinton's a strong supporter putting uh, references and support for charter schools in his State of the Union. So this has strong bipartisan support. It only has opposition largely from the National Education Association and their uh, member organizations around the country. 
If you're a congressman from Washington running for office and you're down at the NEA headquarters raising thousands of dollars, you predictably aren't going to raise that money unless you come out against charter schools. But can, can you conceive of a situation where you could support parochial uh, uh, public tax so dollars for parochial schools very, or for Christian schools? I did not support the amendment that's in the Constitution at the present time. I thought it was unduly restrictive and went too far. One of the reasons that I was concerned at the time and have a concern today, and I want to be very clear what our Constitution says. I mean, it is the Constitution. I take an oath to uphold it, and I do with the legislation we've passed. No public funds may go to a private school or a religious school, and that is the Constitution, and we can't change it. But and you might be willing to look at it next year if there's such a proposal. I said that I would not lead such an effort, would not be part of such an effort. If somebody acting as a third party put it on the ballot, I would then make a decision accordingly. Governor, sorry your time is up. Congressman, your rebuttal time. I hope people heard very clearly the governor's response to that question. Because I have been insisting from the beginning of the governor's real agenda was to take public tax dollars and give them to private institutions, set the stage for, for vouchers. And you gave him just now two or three t opportunities here to say he would oppose such an amendment that would take public tax dollars and move them into private and other religious schools. L let me say that that's really one of the fundamental dis differences between uh, the governor and myself. I think the working families of this state need and depend upon a strong public educational system. I think it is wrong to see those, those dollars diverted into private academies. Incidentally, we've had charter schools for years in Detroit and elsewhere, uh, magnet schools, uh, target schools, all sorts of options created within a local school system. I support that. Congressman, so, I'm sorry your time is up. I now have to go back to uh, my colleague, Huel Perkins, and your question for Mr. Wolpe. Mr. Wolpe, uh, your opponent, Mr. Engler, claims that his welfare reforms have taken people off of welfare rolls and put them on payrolls, but you have complained many times that these jobs are low-paying. What plan do you offer specifically to lift families out of poverty to independence, and do they embrace continued welfare reform in the state of Michigan? In the debate that we had just a couple of weeks ago, John Engler said that his goal was a goal of making certain all welfare recipients were working. My goal is to get welfare recipients off of welfare so, they're in, and, and so that they can stay off of welfare. Four years after John Engler has taken office, there are today 30,000 more people on AFDC than there were when John Engler came into office. Why is that? Because people are in dead-end jobs and they do not have the resources to be economically self-sufficient. And so the real challenge is to raise the skill level of, of, of people so that they can become self-sufficient. And that is the kind of welfare reform that I support. And how do you do that without raising taxes? Well, you cannot raise taxes, and so we have to work within the, within the uh, means that are at our disposal. But one thing we can do is take advantage of federal resources that are out there that John Engler refused to use, $88 million dollars had to be sent back to the federal government essentially this year that were available to help with um, daycare and to help with job training needs of the welfare recipients. John Nagler didn't want to go after those funds. And as a result, we end up keeping people on welfare longer because we don't have, they don't have the tools to get off of welfare and to become economically self-sufficient. That is simply not smart from a taxpayer standpoint. It's not smart from the goal of getting welfare recipients out of, off, off of welfare and independent. Your question for the governor. I think, I'm just, sorry, I, I think, governor? Yeah, I think I, we've just heard some Washington mathematics here, and this is an easy one to check. But today there are fewer people on public assistance. We closed some 23,000 cases last year, and we'll let the record speak on this one. The congressman's simply wrong on his facts. What he is also, uh, I think, overlooking is something I'm very proud of is the fact that today one in four parents on AFDC are working. And I think we need to understand if we're going to end welfare as we know it, we do that through work. And the idea that someone's going to go from welfare to middle management is probably not plausible. But they can go from welfare to an hourly job, to gaining skills, to getting an education, and then moving ahead. And that's exactly what we're doing is opening the door to opportunity. We're ending what has been a welfare dependency process, uh, the failed liberalism of the past, the old great 60s, great society programs. They didn't work. We're changing them. We're moving ahead. Okay, Governor, thank you very much. Shul, your question now for Governor Engler. Uh, Governor Engler, the advocates of Proposal C tell us that a yes vote would lower auto insurance rates for everyone by limiting the rights of the injured party to sue. What we don't hear very often is that these reductions are not guaranteed and that after six months, insurance companies can raise the rates again. Why do you support such a measure? I support this because it is something that will lower for everybody in Michigan automobile insurance rates by 16%. 
I'm very comfortable that if we reform the legal system, we'll bring costs down. Now, that's a tough, tough challenge to reform the legal system, but under my administration, we've said no to the trial lawyers. We reform medical malpractice. This auto insurance bill should have been affected last April, and we should have been cutting insurance rates long before now, but the trial lawyers put it on the ballot. I don't go to the trial lawyers for my advice. Uh, my opponent, 1-800-CALL-SAM, uh, has new meaning. That's who he calls for funds. And recently he was in his office receiving thousands of dollars of campaign contributions. Of course he can't support cracking down on the legal system. But I've had it with trial lawyers. I've had it with lawyers who are costing the taxpayers millions of dollars. The and caps, the caps on, on the rights of, trial about the of parties are, are permanent, but you do not have a permanent guarantee on reducing the rates of insurance companies. We, have a, we would have a cap of a million dollars under our law. The next highest cap in the nation is 250000 Anybody would have the option to buy up to $5 million worth of caps. The market price will bring the auto insurance down. We had uh, a similar experience in workers' compensation where the reforms have been bringing workers' compensation costs down because we created a competitive marketplace. But we also said no to trial lawyers who wanted to get their share off the top. And I think people are tired of being ripped off. And I think they're tired of politicians defending them in Washington and Lansing like my opponent's done throughout his career. The governor may not take his advice from the trial lawyers because he takes it from the insurance companies, the people that have written Proposal C, that wrote Proposal D two years ago. Uh, this is an absolute ripoff on the consumers of the state. Why is it that the insurance lobby is trying to fi is financing Proposal C? Is it an effort, in an effort to lower their profits? I mean, Governor, you can't really say what you just said with a straight face, trying to pretend that this is consumer legislation. This is legislation that was written by the insurance industry. It's legislation that John Engler has carried year after year. He even went so far in, the last, in this session of the legislature to try to prevent the people of Michigan from having another vote on this bill. The court said he couldn't do it. He was trying to do something that was illegal, unconstitutional. So now we have a chance, once again, on Proposal C, to say that when we said no, we meant no. Under a won't be stabbing administration, you'll get real reform and a real 20% rate cut. Congressman, we're out of time. Thank you very much. Our next questioner is Roberta Jacinta. Yeah, Congressman, uh, I'd like to hammer again on the one point that I think is number one in the hearts and minds of most people in Michigan. You talk about middle class families, and I think, again, it is crime. Can you tell me three specific things you plan to do to, to cut down on crime and, and to prevent people from having to worry about an 11 year old who might get a gun and either kill them or their children? I have, in fact, laid out a 29-point agenda, a comprehensive approach to the issues of crime and violence that are destroying our neighborhoods and our communities. We have to be tough when it comes to locking up the violent felons. I believe in truth and sentencing. I wish truth and sentencing were actually effective law in Michigan. In the Walpi Stabenow administration, we will have truth and sentencing. So 20 years means 20 years. Secondly, we've got to staff and train our prison personnel properly so we can prevent the kinds of escapes prevent the kinds of dangers to the public safety that are being created right now by inadequate staffing and security. Thirdly, one of the f first things I would want to do as governor is work with the new federal crime law and with local communities to put onto the street the 3,400 cops that are going to be available uh, over the, uh, for Michigan under that legislation. This is legislation, incidentally, that John Engler, the governor, opposed. Fourth, I want to establish a system of drug courts throughout the state that will give nonviolent drug offenders a choice either clean up their act uh, have a, and get treatment and get off of their addiction or go to jail. We know that there are something like 80% of people in our prisons today that have a drug addiction, a drug problem. It's time that we got serious about trying to prevent recycling of these people through the prison doors. We need not only to get tough when it comes to locking up the violent felons, we need to get serious about prevention. And then finally, we need to work with children to give them some real hope we need to get people in local communities serving as mentors, as role models, as authority figures, working with youngsters that need the love and the discipline they're not getting. Congressman, thank you. Uh, Governor Engler, your rebuttal. Couldn't be a bigger difference on any issue than this one. When I want advice on crime, I call a cop. The congressman calls a social worker. My three things would be to abolish parole for murder and rape, would be to uh, have a tough sentence guideline bill passed, and to get the punk prison established. Another thing that I would throw in is to crack down on these liberal judges. Liberal judges like James J. Giddings, who think that prisoners shouldn't be wearing uniforms, but instead ought to be paid witness fees, ought to have colored TVs, ought to have a press agent. Well, the congressman, you know Judge Giddings pretty well. He's a contributor of yours, and if I wouldn't take a contribution from him, but I think you ought to give his money back. I think you ought to say, Judge, you're too liberal. I don't want your money. Give it back. 
Britta. As an East Sider governor, I have to ask you this next question. Uh, Lake St. Clair this summer was turned into a living, breathing toilet, and I don't see anything that's happened that will prevent that from happening again next year. Is this important to you, and what are you doing about it? It's critically important. I think we have to be concerned about our environment in every respect, and I think we've got a great record there. But Lake St. Clair specifically, I was down there immediately, and what we did, of course, was deal with the immediate cleanup of the seaweed problem, but then uh, with the investigation that we've done, uh, subsequently there have been four new orders issued uh, to communities and municipalities about cleanup and uh, reform of their own uh, sewer and water systems. We also are matching every federal dollar that's available. We've got uh, programs in place that have allowed us to draw down those federal dollars, and we've added uh, a tripling of the resource for that uh, sewer construction project out there. So and across our state. So we've made good headway. We need to do more. This is an area where the congressman actually had an idea that uh, maybe has some potential uh, using the unclaimed bottle deposits as a, as a fund, although they're currently under law committed to something else, but maybe that could be changed and maybe we'll win the lawsuit. But those are the kinds of things that we need to look at. But the local communities themselves have an obligation and uh, we've now got, I think, a plan in place that is gonna see some uh, big dividends being paid even as soon as uh, next summer. And um, across the state, we can look forward, I think, to continued progress. A 30% improvement in air and water quality in Michigan in the last five years. A Southeast Michigan ready to be redesignated under clean air. So the environmental news is very good. A DNR that's working much better today. A DNR that's more accessible to open to the public, where the public can monitor what is happening and be involved in the decision. So I think the news is good, but we've got to, as I've just said, uh, deal with the specific issues as they rise. Congressman Rolpe, your rebuttal, please. The governor has effectively rewritten the state motto, if you seek a beautiful peninsula, look about you, just don't go near the water. Uh, we have major problems, billions of tons of, uh, of garbage pouring into and sewage pouring into our lakes. Governor's response to the environment has been really remarkable. It's been to gut the DNR, to remove water inspectors, people who, uh, who uh, monitor water quality. It's been to really close out people, and he says that we've got a more effective DNR now. What he means by that is the polluters have an easier time because there's no public participation, no public access. Uh, my history has been a very different history. It's been one of getting the environmental community together with industry to take a preventative approach to problems of pollution. The Dow Chemical Company, the Sierra Club, came behind legislation I authored in Congress, the Pollution Prevention Act, in demonstration that what makes good sense for the environment can make good Thank sense you, for Thank you, Mr. Wolfie. As well. we, we, are, we are out of time for your rebuttal. Let's go now to uh, Hugh McDermott, Detroit Free Press, and your question for Howard Wolpe. Mr. Wolpe, in general terms, would you rate the job being done by the Clinton administration over the last two years? Uh, and in, in light of the fact that he's coming to Michigan this week and again later this month, would you tell us how comfortable you'd feel having Bill Clinton campaigning for you? Well, Bill Clinton was already in here once, uh, campaigning for me and for others, and I feel very comfortable then. I would welcome him again. I think he'll be coming back to the state. Uh, Bill Clinton, is, I believe, has taken on uh, some of the toughest challenges that uh, we have ignored for so many years, and it's been a struggle. Uh, the health insurance debate that we've been seeing, uh, every vested interest in, in the country has come in behind that to make that job very difficult. Uh, and so I, I give him high marks for moving forward in some agenda, uh, items, the reduction of the deficit, the improvement in the national economy. A lot of that I think uh, you have to credit in terms of national policy. Uh, John Engler would like to take credit for the national recovery, but I think we all clearly understand that the uptick we're experiencing in Michigan was not John Engler's work, it was the work of the auto industry that's retooling and, 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 and coming back and a result of the national recovery. But again, this election is not an election uh, involving Bill Clinton, it's an election between John Engler and Howard Wolpe. And I want to just take the last few moments to say that, you know, the kind of tough talk we've heard from the governor tonight is really gives new meaning to election year conversion. This is a governor who time and time again has done one thing and said another. When he was in the legislature, this governor who talks so tough actually sponsored legislation to legalize prostitution within our state of Michigan. He sponsored legislation to legalize marijuana. He has done all sorts of things, and then he comes forward and tries to present this kind of appearance that he is really the, the toughest kid on the block in an election year. It is that kind of deception and it's that kind of, of double talk that I think is a grounds is, is the reason people become so cynical about what they're hearing from government these days. Mr. Wolpe, thank you very much. Your rebuttal, Governor Engler. Well, thank you very much. Um, certainly I'm delighted that uh, President Clinton's coming in to campaign for Mr. Wolpe. The recent polls have indicated that he has a, a credibility problem with the voters of this state and I think it's similar to that of uh, Congressman Wolpe. I think um, in the presidential 
visit. Uh, certainly there will be money raised and funds uh, will become available. But what's the message? What's the message? President Clinton ran as a new Democrat, and I think he disappointed people because he didn't then deliver on whatever that promise meant or what they thought that it meant. In this campaign, Congressman Wolpe, we know he's from Washington. We know he served a long time in Congress. We've heard a lot of congressional double talk, but what's he stand for? What's his agenda? What will he do? We haven't heard that. There will be time for that, perhaps, in the remaining four weeks. But I think that's why um, he's having some difficulty in this campaign. And I think it would make the debate easier if we knew what he did stand for. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Hugh, your question now for Governor Uh, uh Crime question, Governor. Uh, again, uh, a few moments ago you mentioned the fact that uh, in campaigning you had had backdrops of sheriff's deputies and, mm -hmm. and police and, uh, endorsing you. And yet uh, you were opposed to the recently passed federal crime bill and specifically opposed its uh, assault weapons ban, which I would guess probably a large majority of those people who have endorsed you supported, including your own commander of the state police. Uh, why this contradiction? I think uh, because uh, we recognize that, uh, that unfortunately uh, the laws don't prevent criminal behavior. The laws don't stop a weapon from falling into the wrong hands. The laws do drive a wedge, though, between a lot of Americans who believe strongly in the Constitution and the Second Amendment. I have felt that our approach in Michigan, where we make sure that we lock up violent criminals, that we keep them there, that we don't let them out on parole, that we change the parole board process, that we expand the prison capacity, that we get tough on juveniles, that we build a new juvenile prison, that we do those kinds of things. Those are tangible, those are real, those make a difference. And I think um, when you look at the assault ban, it simply doesn't get the job done. And there isn't any evidence anywhere in the country that it's gotten the job done. So many of the violent people we're dealing with are facing a death penalty every day out on the street, and uh, it doesn't stop them. And so um, that is... Uh, that is a problem that uh, I feel we've approached it by getting at you know, the perpetrators of the crime and not trying to punish those who follow the law. You did object to the crime bill? I did. Congressman Wolpe, your reply. It's very interesting. John Engler, in his State of the State at the beginning of this year, actually said he was going to support a ban on assault weapons. I think he has forgotten that inclusion, or he has simply just changed his position one more time. Um, he talks about getting tough on juveniles and talks about the establishment of a new punk prison. But this is the governor that has been downsizing every juvenile detention facility in the state. Maxie and others as well. Up in Flint there were 80 beds before John Engler came for juveniles that were violent, that had to be detained in secure facilities. Today there are only 40 beds in that one community. Uh, so again, the point that I'm trying to make here is there's a huge gap between the governor's tough talk and the and the reality of the policies that he has implemented. He's cut the state police. He attacked the crime lab. Uh, he has, uh, he cut 911 service and just shifted that burden to local communities. Thank you, Congressman. Huel Perkins of TV2, your question for the Democratic uh, contender, Mr. Wolpe. Mr. Wolpe, we haven't heard the words play ball in quite some time, but if <laughs> and when the Tigers do resume uh, playing ball, there are many here in Metro Detroit who would like to see them play baseball in a new downtown stadium. The Illich family would, of course, put up some money, but how much, if any, should the state put up with this project, and what will you do to convince lawmakers that the state should participate? <laughs> Let me, that is probably one area of agreement that we're all, we're both Tiger fans here. Uh, I want to see the Tigers obviously uh, remain in Michigan and the Tiger Stadium remain in Detroit, and I think the state may well have a, a, a real role to play in making that happen, particularly as it relates to infrastructure, to the investment for the infrastructure to sustain the stadium. I think the approach to the Tiger Stadium should be the same as to any other economic development project around the state. Well, we need to know a bit more about what will be the specific economic uh, spin-offs that will flow from the investment, what jobs will be created, what other investments there will be. Um, and once we know that, we can make a judgment as to how much of investment would be warranted and if we have a revenue stream to support that support from the state. Um, but I think that is certainly a legitimate function of state to be involved in a partnership with local communities, not only Detroit, but around the state, to making that kind of economic development happen in ways that will be beneficial for the community and, of course, for, for the state overall. Governor Engler? I think that uh, Detroit uh, ought to have the stadium downtown. I think the people of Michigan ought to keep it downtown. But I don't think we ought to use tax dollars to build the stadium. I 
suggested in infrastructure and going as far back as more than a year ago with the so-called SPEDA legislation. I also think if we're going to help urban centers, Detroit and others across the state, that what we have to do is to make it very clear that we're going to bring the cost of doing business down. That one area where the congressman and I disagree is that his approach would have given Detroit a 9% income tax uh, by defeating Proposal A. I think that would have been devastating to the city. It's one of the reasons I worked hard to make sure we got that passed. Our reforms in the DNR have allowed us to help begin cleaning up the city to reuse industrial sites. That's also how you help. In fact, that very standard of cleanup uh, perhaps might be involved as part of the project of getting a site for Detroit Stadium downtown. Okay, Governor, thank you. Hewell, your question for Governor Engler. Governor Engler, in an effort to cut the state budget, you agreed to shut down the Lafayette Mental Health Clinic. Uh, uniformed officers were called in to wrestle citizens and patients away from the doors. The Democratic Party has suggested, perhaps unfairly, that lives were at stake here. Do you have any regrets about the closing of that clinic or the way it was handled? There are some who say it's a sign of your lack of compassion for the working man, for the average man, for people with problems. Well, I, I certainly regret how it was handled. I mean, it was a very, very difficult decision. Uh, the decision's the right decision. Uh, it was a very difficult decision to implement because of the interference of the uh, courts and the, uh, the planning that had been done kept stopping and starting. And I think it was very unfortunate the way it, it finally happened. It was the right decision, though. Our costs. Uh, we're in excess of half a million dollars a year at Lafayette Clinic, about fewer than 40 patients, more than 220 employees. Um, we had outpatient services there dealing with 400 people. We wanted to make sure we took care of those folks. We uh, arranged with Wayne State, and today, instead of 400, we're treating 1,000 people. Um, research was taking place there. We wanted to continue that at Wayne in Michigan. We're doing that. We rank third in the nation in research. We're number one. Um, in the Great Lakes region in terms of per capita spending in mental health. There's better services available. We're treating some 7,500 more children today. 30% increase in children's services the way we've restructured mental health programs. You're right about the ad. It's been called the meanest ad in America by the Washington Post. It's, it's attracted national attention. And uh, I think that that ad is really an attempt to use and to twist the debate. And it's been roundly criticized by professionals in and outside of Michigan as doing a disservice to those who might need treatment at the mental health system. We're proud of the gains that we've made and the consistency in supporting a community-based system as opposed to impersonal institutionalized service goes back some 25 years. Governors in both parties have, have stayed that course. Uh, Congressman Wolpe even voted for the mental health code that uh, sets out this policy. So I think uh, we've got the right policy. Governor, thank you. I have to interrupt uh, you. your rebuttal. Mr. Governor, Wolf. that act was the meanest act any governor has implemented in this state. People should not be treated that way they were treated that night, with police coming in to, to supervise the eviction of, the, of these mentally ill patients. No one should be treated that way. And in a Wolfie Stabenow administration, no one will be treated that way. And Lafayette is not an unique situation. Cold water, when they moved to close that facility, they didn't have the plans ready there either. And so there were six uh, six very medically unstable people who were, had been living in Colorado for many years, four of the six were dead within 18 months of their being forced out of that institution. The governor doesn't understand that his actions have real people at the end of them, that there are human consequences here, that, that people get hurt when you don't think through the plan. Today in Wayne County, it takes a year and a half for a mentally ill child to get, to get mental health treatment. When he came into office four years ago, it was only 16 weeks. If that's Congress not up, sorry, I have, management, I have to interrupt you. Uh, your, your time is up. Uh, Roberta Chesina from WWJ Radio, your question for Mr. Wolby. Congressman, um, Michigan is number 19, according to the Tax Foundation. It's number 19 when it comes to the money per capita we send to Washington, D.C. 19. We're number 44 when it comes to how much money we get back from the federal government. Do you consider that a problem? And if so, what can be done about that? It is a problem, and it's a problem that's going to be increased by virtue of John Engler's Proposal A, because among the other things that happened in Proposal A is that federal income taxes were increased by $400 million because of the loss of deductions. And that is money that is essentially now going to Washington, out of the Michigan economy that we would otherwise have had right here. Of course it is a problem, and it's also a problem when the governor does not take advantage of funds that are available at the national level I mentioned the daycare funds that he refused to take advantage of earlier. Then we don't get back our fair share of those dollars. And uh, one of the things the governor should do is to make sure we get back every last dollar that in fact is available that can help us meet our problems and meet our challenges right here uh, uh, within our own state. Um, you know, there's something else that I just want to say. The governor just talked about this, uh, the income tax. I don't know how many people realize it, but it was John Engler's vote when he was in the Senate 
that increased the Detroit income tax. He was the deciding vote by 3% that provided the tax on suburban voters for Detroit. This is your anti-taxer. And this is the man who years ago supported the progressive, the graduate income tax, actually sponsored a resolution to that effect. Um, there is a whole history here that I don't think people understand because he's done a very good job of laying out a message that's quite contrary to the reality. Um, let me say something else. Um, there are other things that I think need to be done to get this economy of ours moving again. One of them is to take advantage of the pension funds that have been set aside for business investment. John Engler is using his billion dollars of authority to send money out of the state, even to the United Kingdom. Congressman, I want I'm sorry. In Michigan. I'm sorry I have to interrupt. Your time is up. Uh, Governor Engler, your rebuttal. Well, I think that's more congressional double talk, frankly. Uh, the congressman was in Washington when many of the formulas that were written that are so discriminatory and so harsh toward Michigan. Uh, welfare funding, for example, where states like Arkansas and Tennessee get 70 cents back of every dollar spent. In Michigan, we get 50 cents. And the statistic you gave measures that, uh, and it measures defense spending, and it measures, and Congressman Wolpe helped to close Wordsmith when he was there. So those are the kinds of uh, decisions that uh, get made in Washington. We've actually been moving up ever so slightly. It's tough to get off the bottom, but we've done that, and we're going to keep pushing along that regard. And I think that... Uh, my record of cutting taxes is second to none, 11 tax cuts, and people aren't going to be fooled by all the stuff they're hearing tonight. They've got the money in their pocket. Roberta, your question for the governor. Well, I thought it was interesting what Congressman Wolpe said earlier about uh, when in your days in the Michigan State Legislature that you wanted to legalize prostitution and marijuana. Do you still feel that way, or what changed your mind? <laughs> I don't have a clue what he's talking about. Uh, you know, we'll have to go back in the records and find out what on earth he's talking about. Uh, all I can say, if that ever was a position, if there was ever a bill that somehow I got uh, sponsorship and piled with, it, it was a dumb decision then. I don't support it now and don't agree with it. I'd have to write it off, I guess, to whatever youthful indiscretion I had at the age of whatever that was. If it was 22 in the first term or 24 in the second, I don't have a clue what he's talking about. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear him say that. I, uh, it was very interesting in some of the advertising that he has done. He went back to a vote that I cast back in 1975 against mandatory sentences, ignoring the 80 times I voted for mandatory sentences for, for federal crimes during my time in the Congress. Uh, I call that hypocrisy, Governor, when you can play that kind of game. You were, that is simply being a hypocrite. Well, I think hypocrisy is bouncing checks in Washington and then voting against investigating that and the bank and the is, post office. And is this I know that from your running free, mate. Uh, are we into a free exchange here? <laughs> no, I'm going, to, I'm going to take charge here, gentlemen. I, mean, I would love to respond to that. I, I, I think a lot of viewers would like to see a free exchange, but we do have rules, uh, I guess uh, some would say, unfortunately. Let's go to Hugh McDermott uh, from the uh, Detroit Free Press. And your question, please, for... Mr. Wolpe, uh, about PACs. Uh, back in April, you said you wouldn't accept PAC contributions, and in fact, uh, with regard to John Engler, you said, it strikes me that if this governor was interested in real campaign finance reform, he would not just be dancing around the margins. Nowadays, John Engler is the one who's not accepting PAC contributions, and you are. Why this uh, flip-flop? First of all, I invited John Engler and my other Democratic opponents in the primary to join me in, in not accepting PAC dollars. We'd all be on the same level playing field. Uh, that did not happen, so I was not about to unilaterally disarm. Secondly, when John Engler talks about his not receiving PAC funds, when he has been out there raising PAC monies for the Republican Party and for the independent expenditures that are being made on behalf of his own campaign for governor, he is playing a game once again. The reality is the way the present system operates. We are both uh, receiving uh, political action committee funds, uh, admittedly from somewhat different groups. John Engler has a uh, it's the insurance lobby that he is very close to, it's the utilities, it's those kinds of interests that he represents, and he does a good job fighting for them. Uh, this is, again, I think one of the major differences between the two of us. Uh, I'm going to be out there not fighting for some of these most powerful of the interests that have dominated what's happening in Lansing. I'm going to be out there fighting for the people of this state uh, who I think ought to get a fair shake when it comes to auto insurance reform. Uh, I think the insurance companies are making enough. I think it's time that ratepayers got some relief, a really permanent rate reduction of 20%, which is what I've indicated a Wolpe Stabenow administration will produce. I think it's time that adult education funds, instead of being channeled off to some of his corporate friends, like the Amway company that just is making record uh, sales nowadays, uh, to train their uh, corporate employees about the Amway corporate culture, I think adult education funds ought to be used for adult education to upgrade the skill level of, of our workers. And that's what will happen in a Wolpe Stabenow administration. 
All right, Congressman, thank you. Uh, Governor Ingle, your response? Well, again, again, I think more congressional trouble talk, frankly. I mean, this is sort of like the debate in Washington where everybody's for PAC reform, but it never seems to happen. Well, in Michigan, I made the announcement as I became governor that I would accept no PAC contributions. And, Congressman, tonight there's an opportunity for you to say, I'll go the rest of the way without any PAC money or give back the thousands of dollars you've got down at NEA National Education Association headquarters last week in Washington. I'm sure the PACs were rolling out the checks. I mean, give it back or stop tonight. Um, you've taken more than a half million dollars, and that was the last filing, which was a long time ago. I think that uh, in this campaign, you made the proposal in the primary, and you weren't serious. You got called on it by your primary opponents. They embarrassed you, including your running mate, and you retreated, and uh, you never were serious about stopping to take PAC contributions. Governor, thank you very much. Hugh, your question for the governor. Governor, for all your t talk about tough choices and, and decision-making, uh, you've been remarkably fuzzy over the last four years on the subject of gas taxes. Uh, Michigan's roads to anybody with eyes will show that they're crumbling and falling apart. Yet Michigan has a very relatively low gas tax, ranks 46th uh, in local and state spending on highways. Uh, is it safe to assume that once this election's over, if you are reelected, you're going to take that, uh, bite the bullet, and do something about it? We have to tackle the transportation issue because the Build Michigan program, which I put in place uh, back in 1991 and 92, uh, will expire at the end of next year. We've set a record in terms of construction. I think the other thing that people would say is that everywhere they've gone, particularly in the last couple of years, there's been construction taking place. And I believe we have to invest in the infrastructure. I've always supported fuel taxes. Uh, I think fuel taxes are part of the future in terms of dealing with infrastructure. We're also working on the um, related questions, not only to roads and bridges and highways, but also to some of the public transportation questions, such as the merger of uh, DDOT and uh, uh, the smart system. So I think transportation has to be on the agenda in 1995. I think uh, both Speaker Hilligans and uh, Senate Majority Postumus agree with that, and so uh, it will be dealt is, with. Is that a yes on a higher gas tax? In well, I, I think that certainly is going to be one of the options. Uh, Wisconsin, uh, it's kind of interesting what they've done. They've put out four uh, scenarios, all the way from a rosy scenario with a huge increase in the fuel tax to a uh, gloomy scenario with a very uh, stand pat on revenues. I think we use Build Michigan to, uh, for bonding purposes. I think that we will have to look at higher fuel taxes in the future. I don't shy away from that. And as I said, as a legislator, I've supported that. It has to be the right plan. And I'm proud of what we've done because we've gotten M59 off the drawing boards. Uh, we're going to dedicate um, out on Haggerty Road to here very shortly. Uh, we've just reopened I-75. Uh, we're doing the bypass over at Grand Rapids. We're doing things at Flint at Bishop Airport. I mean, we've done a lot of construction, more than double what was previously planned by the DDOT that we inherited. All right, Governor, thank you very much. Congressman Volpe, your rebuttal. I'm not sure I heard his answer. Um, I think that if, in fact, uh, we are at the heavy limit, if we may be still for a while, then I think clearly voter bonding may be the only means of raising additional <coughs> revenue for roads and bridges and highways. The infrastructure is falling apart in the state. It has been neglected, as have other needs in the state. Um, but I, and I'm glad to hear the governor has finally attended to the fact that we've got a problem in our hands. But that's four years <coughs> very late into his administration. Let me just say something else about this whole discussion of, of taxes and tax cuts and all of that. I think it's time for some truth in advertising. Uh, John Engler has been taking credit all, all along for the big property tax cuts. Those property tax cuts were fashioned by Democrats, offered by my running mate, Debbie Stabenow. I had some problems about the way it happened because I was concerned about how John Engler would put together the replacement revenues. But in the name of truth and advertising, it was Debbie Stabenow that offered the property tax cut. It's her name on the bill, not John Engler's. All right, Congressman, thank you very much. Uh, Governor Engler, thank you very much. And to our panelists, thank you very much. We now uh, go to our closing remarks. And uh, Governor John Engler, you have a minute and 30 seconds, sir. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk with the voters in Michigan tonight. I've enjoyed this chance to uh, debate the issues and to lay out a vision and a plan for the second Engler administration. We're proud of what we've done the last four years. Job creation at a record level, nearly 500,000 new jobs since August of 1991, a 5.5% unemployment rate, the lowest in 20 years. We want to continue to create more good paying, high quality jobs in the second term by cutting taxes by reforming welfare, by keeping government spending in check. Some 5,000 fewer employees work for government today. That's 5,000 fewer people that our tax dollars have to support. We're getting national attention for the changes that we've made in welfare, in taxes, in schools, in education. And I think we can be proud of what we're doing for kids and young people, for working men and women in this state, because we're creating Michigan a state of opportunity. And our job as governor and as a state government is to get our costs under control, 
to be competitive, to be the best that we can be with the services we provide. We've done that. We've made hard choices. We've had to take on tough issues against almost insurmountable odds. But yet, we've done that with an eye toward making Michigan the state where there are opportunities. And now people are staying here. People are coming home to Michigan because they like what we're doing. We've got a reputation now as a state that means business, a state where you can do business. And I think for us, for us in Michigan, that's where we want to be. We want to build on this foundation in the second term. We do not, we do not want to turn back and turn over Michigan to someone whose Washington strategy failed there, left Washington mired in debt, would do the same for our state. So let's continue to go forward, and I ask tonight for your support, your continued enthusiastic assistance to get Michigan moving forward on the right track the way we've been doing it the last four years. Thank you very much. And now, Congressman John Wolpe, your closing remarks, oh, sir. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Howard <laughs> Wolpe. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Slip of the tongue, sir. I apologize Thank for you. that. John Engler loves to talk about how tough he is. But the real question is, who is he tough on? He's tough on the innocent people who have been hurt or murdered by prisoners who have escaped from his, from his prisons or have been accidentally released. He's tough on the mentally ill who did not have a political lobby when he brutally evicted the patients from the Lafayette Clinic. He's tough on every driver in the state when he lets the most profitable insurance lobby in the country charge the highest rates in the Midwest. He's tough on, our, on the parents when he closes down the Michigan Education Trust, one of the best ways you can afford a college education today. And he is tough on our kids. Frankly, Governor, I do not see, uh, understand how you can siphon off public tax dollars directed at public education, a way to the tobacco merchants, a way to private academies, and then pretend you didn't know what you were doing. What the people of Michigan want is a governor who will be tough on the problems of our state, not tough on our people. And that's why I'm here tonight. You know, I have 142,000 miles of Fort Horace that I've been driving all around the state. And everywhere I go, people are saying the same thing. They want a governor who will level with them for a change. A governor who will have the courage to get beyond political expedience, to make decisions with our future in mind. A governor who will stand up for the middle class families, the people who are working hard every day, and who will also stand up against the special interest. A governor who will be on their side. I will be that governor. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Howard Wolpe. We certainly appreciate it. Governor John Engler, thank you very much. I'd also like to thank our panelists tonight. One more time, uh, Hugh Perkins from, uh, from TV2, Eyewitness News, Roberta Jacina from WWJ Radio, and Hugh McDermott from the Detroit Free Press. This, of course, has been the second of three debates between uh, Democrat Howard Wolpe and our uh, Re uh, Republican Governor John Engler. They have one more debate, which will be coming up uh, uh, soon on PBS. I also want to thank uh, our co-sponsor for tonight's debate, the Detroit Economic Club, and of course uh, TV2, and we do want to uh, tell you uh, that uh, don't forget to exercise your right to vote coming up next month. So for those of you uh, around the state and uh, watching on uh, C-SPAN and listening on the radio across the state, my name is Rich Fisher. Thank you very much for being with us, and good night. Bob Carr, after 18 years in Washington, he just can't tell the truth about taxes. I just voted to cut taxes. But Carr actually cast the tie-breaking vote to pass Bill Clinton's huge tax increase. Just ask Bill. If it had not been for Congressman Carr, the plan would have gone down. We passed it by one vote. Carr has voted for higher income taxes and for higher taxes on Social Security. Double-talking Bob Carr. He's everything that's wrong with Congress. Five, four, three, two, it's target time.